join us. So we want to welcome you. If you want to fill out a welcome card, we've got welcome cards in the back of the pews, and we'd love to just get your phone number, have a time together to get to know you better, send out a little welcome letter to you so you know what's happening around here. All right. So I have a couple different things, and I apologize because I don't have a PowerPoint this morning. <laughs> when my... Okay, just true confessions. When my husband goes out of town, our house just misses him. And so for whatever reason, our power goes out, our water ends up getting all used up. I mean, just the weirdest things happen. So I had an interesting 24 hours. I was in the dark last night with a flashlight trying to put notes together. Had no power or water. Yeah. My husband said, don't say any of that. Just, uh, just wing it. And I'm like, no, I'm going to tell everybody. So, <laughs> so anyway, so I don't have a PowerPoint for you, but you know what? God is still good. And, you know, at, 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 I was thinking, well, you know, you just have to just put on an act, Kim. And the Holy Spirit was just like, no, no act, just be authentic. So there is authenticity at its finest. Amen. All right. So today's Mother's Day, the name of today's message is Calling Forth the Mama Bear Spirit. All right, that is what today's message is about. And I have some fun quotes. Um, I wish I had them up for you to read as well, but I'm going to read them to you. This one says, one mother is more venerable than a thousand fathers. And this is from Manus Mriti. And I just, I had to read that because I thought it was so fun. This is the legal text in Hindu. And so I just wanted you all to know right off the bat, it's false theology. I don't have a competitive nature. I just wanted you to see what other people believed. That one mother is more venerable than a thousand fathers, okay? Uh, Next quote, this is the reason why mothers are more devoted to their children than fathers. It is that they suffer more in giving them birth and are more certain that they are their own. That is from Aristotle. Oh my goodness. And that's like, how long? Aristotle, come on. Still true today. There is only one pretty child in the world, and every mother has it. Chinese proverb. Isn't that the truth, women? Our, we have total rose-colored glasses. You know, our children are just beautiful. And here's another one said a little bit differently. Every beetle is a gazelle in the eyes of its mother. That's a Moorish proverb. I thought that was so cute. Our our kid is smartest, and they're the most athletic, and, you know, they're the best at something, right? Next one. This is uh, going through the teenage years. This is Mark Twain. My mother had a great deal of trouble with me, but I think she enjoyed it. (laughs) I just want to smack him, you know? I'm like, double for my trouble. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that because I have five children, that somehow I get a double reward in heaven. That's my great hope, okay? I'm like, maybe I'll get just something a little more. All right, and then these are a couple of really sweet ones. This is from Abraham Lincoln. No man is poor who has a godly mother. And then another one, he says, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Thought that was so sweet. And then John Quincy Adams, all that I am, my mother made me. So just sweet tributes to mom. And then I have this one video that I wanted to show you guys. Dakota, can you do that, that one? Thomas Edison came home from school and gave a letter to his mother. He told her, my teacher gave this to me and told me to only give it to mother. His mother's eyes were tearful as she read the letter out loud to her child. Your son is a genius. This school is too small for him and doesn't have enough good teachers for training him. Please teach him yourself. After that, he was homeschooled and was taught reading, writing, and math by his mother. 
Many years later, his mother passed away, and he was now one of the greatest inventors of the century. One day he was looking through old family things. Suddenly he saw a folded paper in the corner of a drawer. On that paper it was written, Your son is adult, mentally ill. We won't let him come to school anymore. Edison cried for hours, and then he wrote in his diary, Thomas Alva Edison was an adult child, grown by a hero mother, became the genius of the century. Only parents can give their children the best start, and set the foundation for success in life by teaching them. Isn't that beautiful? Wow, something we just didn't know. Thomas Edison's mother, pretty heroic that she kept that from him. Yeah. All right. So one of the things that I found that I thought was so interesting um, that I tucked away um, for some day and I wanted to share today was that when a mother is pregnant, the fetal cells in the baby's blood somehow makes it through the placenta and into the mother's blood. This is scientifically proven. So it is found that the baby's cells mix with the mother while she is pregnant and is still found in the mother's body decades later, which is just amazing. And so when, when mothers say, I carry you in my heart, it's because the DNA is still inside of a mother's body. Uh, some of those cells uh, are immune cells, which is pretty amazing. They actually strengthen the immune system of the mother. Um, while others um, are undefined but are called connective tissue, these cells play a role in regeneration or healing of the mother's tissues. So it's just so phenomenal. Decades later, your baby's cells that are uniquely their own are still within a mother's body healing the mother. Uh, and... Researchers have seen that fetal cells integrate into lung tissue and that, and this is the, the, really the neatest thing, they have seen them come to the rescue when a mother's heart needs to be, uh, is injured or needs to be repaired. And they have also shown up at the site of tumors. And so I just thought, wow, God, you are just so amazing the way that you have made um, mothers and just that that is something that mothers carry that with their kids long after, you know, they're out of the house and gone because the DNA is still within a, within a mom. So I wanted to share that with all of you this morning. So the mama bear spirit, we immediately conjure up stuff when it comes to the mama bear and the mama bear spirit. So what does that mean? It means that mom can, moms can be very cuddly and lovable with their kids. But the other part of that is there's this ferocious side, right? There's a ferocious side, meaning, and this is grizzly bears, meaning she will rip to shreds with her teeth anyone who dares to interfere with her cubs without any remorse or concern. And according to bear.org, 70% of human deaths that are caused by grizzly bears are related to a mother grizzly protecting her cubs. Isn't that wild? I wish I had a picture of that grizzly bear. But mama bears will fight anything if her, her babies are threatened in any way. So when, when someone says, I went all mama bear, you know, or I, I, my, my mama bear came out, it's that they were trying to protect someone for some reason. And that they might have even been willing to get violent or dangerous in that interaction or that threat. Um, the mama bear instinct says, I will do anything for the good of my children, and this can happen anytime, anywhere. So in preparation this morning and, and just kind of doing the whole tribute for mothers, I just so felt that um, this mother bear spirit of of the instinct that comes forward that says, no, you're not going to cross that line with my kids, or I'm going to protect my children at all cost. This kind of a spirit is desperately needed in this age. It's a ferocious warrior, uh, protective spirit of the things that are most dear to us. And, um, you know, 
when when you we're looking at all these current events, you know, my heart is that the church would know how to respond, that we would not back down, but that we instead would stand fiercely, ferociously standing for the things that are critically dear and near to our hearts, and that we would not be timid in this day and age, and that we would not shy back in this day and age. Um, I just had to show you guys this. This says, between you and me, it's a mother, a daughter journal. And I saw it at Target, and I picked it up, and I just thought, oh, this will be fun. You know, maybe Brandy and I can do it before she leaves um, my nest. And I'm, I was flipping through the pages, and I have to, I have to share this one with you, because it says this. In a zombie apocalypse, who would you want on your team and why? In a mother-daughter journal. Now, I have to be honest with you guys. The first time I read about someone that was very serious about a zombie apocalypse, like not just in the movies, you know, but like someone that said, you know, get yourself ready for this because this is coming. And then went on to explain it all in writing, you know. And the first time I read it, I thought, you've got to be kidding me. Like, is this for real? Like, this guy is really serious about this. Like, he is trying to help other people prepare for a zombie apocalypse. And I just thought, we have just gone up, just are way off the deep end, right? And then as the year went on, I realized it was on the CDC website. It's been found on other people's websites. And, you know, the, as the year went on, and now I'm here and I'm, I'm standing before you saying, we got we to gotta prepare for a zombie apocalypse. This is the state of where we have now come in our world. And it is so distressing and so like off the charts of what the absurdity of the times that we are in right now and the things that the church, the world is having to face and just it's no longer hidden, right? We have things that are no longer hidden. And in my heart, you know, I, I vacillate when I hear bad news come forth, when I hear of things um, coming around the corner in our future. And no question, our emotions definitely have the feelings and emotions that go along with this kind of might make me feel fearful or apprehensive or not knowing maybe everything that I should be doing. And I kind of want to address that this morning because... This is, honestly, the church's finest hour. And yet, when you just look at the United States of America, the church has been pretty quiet during these times. You know? It's been, it's been way more quiet than it should, should be. And so my heart this morning is, what is our response to these things? As a body of believers, as those that are... Uh, chosen by God, washed in the blood, what should our response be to these very, very serious issues of the day? And, you know, and I know that, you know, we're all across the page as far as um, what, what some people might um, research or might know or, or information that is coming in. So I realize that um, some people are, might be more awake than others. And I realize that uh, you know, some people might still think that a lot of these are just conspiracy theories. However, this is a pulpit of truth, and the truth is what sets people free. And so if we close our eyes to the very facts that most of these conspiracy theories have now all come to pass and are continuing, then we have chosen deception. And so we can't choose deception in the church of Jesus Christ. We must be willing to face the truths of the day and have answers and have, be able to share the hope that is within us. And that is really our stance as the church. So I just, what's in my spirit this morning is that the church has been timid and that more than anything in this time of history, we need to pray for courage and boldness like never before. And that we need to refuse to have our voices silenced. We need to refuse to have our voices silenced. 
all right? And so um, a spirit of valor and bravery is needed. So the number one issue that uh, is probably near and dear to my heart, although there are many, and I, I can rattle off a bunch um, of present day challenges, but the number one thing that I believe is the precursor to many of the others is this opposition to free speech. And this is not new in Christendom. Okay, it might be fairly new in the United States of America because of our constitution, we've had free speech and right now we just feel, feel the heavy handedness coming down upon us. But the truth is this opposition to free speech began right after the church was born. And right after the church was born, preaching about Jesus was forbidden. They did not want the message of Jesus Christ to go forth. And in fact, you were penalized with imprisonment or death if you did continue to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. So as Christians, I'm just here to share with all of us, this is our history. This is part of the birthing of the church, and it has not gone away. In fact, in this time of history, it's more critical than ever that Jesus Christ be lifted up and that Christians speak truth and are not shying away from it. From it. Uh, free speech is the basis of all our other freedoms. It is the rock basis. And without that, uh, you know, the rest of the freedoms get taken, basically. Free speech is the dread of tyrants. They hate it. They'll do anything to stop it. Um, they will buy up all of the TV stations in the United States of America and around the world to keep us from free speech, okay? They will do whatever it takes to shut down the doctors and the websites that have been trying to give free speech. They will do whatever it takes because they want control and power over others. Um, you don't believe in free speech unless you give others the right to offend you by what they say. Now there's a quote, isn't it? You don't believe in free speech unless you give others the right to offend you by what they say. Okay? Because we need to be open to all avenues of what people think. The problem is, is when... One thought disagrees with what they want you to believe. It's only that thought that's being shut down. And that's what we're seeing in present day. If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. The idea that any kind of free society can be constructed in which people will never be offended is absurd. It's absolutely absurd because people, we all have different opinions. If I just threw out one subject this morning, we'd have a room full of different opinions, uh, possibly about that one subject. And I would think that if it was uh, oh, subjects that really mattered and that were in the Bible, that we would all have the same opinion because of the word of God. But when you just look at, you know, the various opinions out there, it's ridiculous to think that we're never going to offend somebody by what we say, because the truth already is an offense. And if we're not people that are welcoming the truth, then we're going to get offended. And so if we don't know how to take care of offense, we can disagree agreeably, right? But if, as Christians, we don't know how to take care of our offenses, then where does that leave us? That kind of leaves us out in left field all alone. Because there's no way you're going to get a large group of people to all agree on one thing. So offenses are normal, is what I'm trying to say. And the Bible says, be unoffendable. So the truth of the matter is, is we can choose to be offended. Like if somebody has a di different opinion than I do, I can choose to be offended or I can choose not. 
I don't have to get all riled up because somebody else has a different opinion than I do, right? Being offended is really a choice. We can, we can choose whether or not we are going to get offended over a matter or not. And we can choose the path, the biblical path of working things out by going to our brother or sister and talking about it. Now, it's unfortunate that sometimes that works in the church and sometimes it doesn't. You know, it, it is unfortunate, but that's part of the growing process for all of us is how to handle disagreements and offenses, how to learn how to forgive. And it's, it's lacking horribly in the world. Um, this is why people, you know, get violent if you don't agree with them. And yeah, it gets, it, it just gets all out of whack. So um, anyways, so what is our stance as the church? It's not to... Uh, be silent in these times. And so we need to know that. We need to know if we have been silent and in our little spheres of influence, we have drawn back or tried to hide away or um, whatever, you know, I don't want to deal with it. So I'm going to, you know, kind of sidestep. Then the truth will not uh, persevere like it needs to persevere. And I know, I know for myself, you know, I was raised I would consider myself raised a good Catholic. And um, both my grandparents were Catholic, and so I had a belief in God, and my parents attended church on Sundays, you know. Um, as I got older, it was only Christmas and Easter. But I had a certain belief of how um, I was going to get to heaven, and that was being a good person. And that was as farthest thing from the truth than what the Bible has to say. And if it wasn't for my husband, who was not my husband at the time, who was just like a little cocky college student, if it wasn't for him and his sharing of the truth with me and making me offended, I probably would not have heard the truth. But he offended me. He offended me. I was so mad because he was saying what I believed was wrong. And he offended me to the point where I was just like, just upset and angry. But the seed was planted. And when I left that conversation, there was that little Holy Spirit. But what if he's right? You see? And so the truth will persevere and have its way, especially when people hear it over and over again. Because Christians are bold to share it. And are not worried or concerned about their reputation or how somebody's going to be offended at them or whatever, you know. And so it's this kind of boldness that is necessary. Because when I went home as a college student and thought about what he had to say to me, I realized that if I continue to hang on to my position, I could be risking my eternity, and the entire lives of my family's eternity. And what do I know? I better, I better do some research. I better study a little bit and find out if what this other opposition is saying could possibly be true. And as I did that, as I learned and opened up myself to hear another perspective, that's where the gospel met me. And that's where I realized it has nothing to do with how good we are. It has everything to do with accepting what Christ has done for us and grabbing a hold of that blood that was shed on our behalf. And so I share that be not to put uh, you know, another religion down because I have lots of beautiful Catholic friends that I love who do believe in the blood of Christ. So please don't hear that this morning. Here that if we are not bold to share the truth and the gospel when God gives us the opportunity, then we in of ourselves are not allowing the truth to permeate the earth like it needs to. And right now, we are the remnant. Right now, we are the remnant. So other issues of the day, there's increasingly sexual explicit curriculum in our public schools. Um, 
Colleges, Christian colleges, are having to compromise and surrender their biblical stance of marriage to the LGBTQ agenda. We have massive racial division on our hands. We have men saying that they can bear children. I mean, that's how absurd it has gotten. Um, we have drag queens reading to children in libraries. There is such a destruction of the nuclear family at stake. Um, if you don't go with the culture of the media, which we're expected to all follow, then hate and horrible words and rejection is the likely outcome. Uh, there's a huge wave to take out our history by the pulling down of all of our monuments and rewriting our history to say that it's something different than what really happened. And, you know, throughout history this has happened where the victors go in and burn everything down to the ground so nobody has a history on, on what happened in that civilization. And we're seeing so much of this in this day and age. You know, and I could go on and on. The, the point of the matter is, in the past, Western Christianity and America was on a home field. And there might have been a few indifferent people up in the stands. There might have been a few people that disagreed. But we were the majority. And now we are not. We are no longer the majority. In fact, we are now playing on enemy turf. And instead, the stands are filled with scoffers and people that believe something different. And, you know, that's all the bad news of what's going on in today. But the good news is that the church is still on the playing field, okay? And we're in an hour where it's time for the church to rally together and say in the last quarter, how are we going to win? That's the day and time that we're in, where our prayers need to be more fervent than ever before, where our service where our influence, where our words of truth need to ring true in every atmosphere we are in. When we walk into the room, we need to be those that are setting the stage and the pace and the direction and giving hope where hope is needed. Do you know the person that has the most hope is the most influential? It's true. The person that has the most hope and the word of God in that hour is the most influential. And this is what is being required of us in this hour. It is not time for us to shrink back. And yes, thank you. It is time for us to rise up. The church has had a great fear, fear of COVID and disease, you know, which basically shows you you don't believe that God's a healing God. Um, they've had a fear of just the leftist agenda, fear of the future, fear that has paralyzed people instead of make them reach down deep and grab them by the bootstraps and say, no, I'm not going to respond that way. I'm not going to give in to fear because God is not a, does not give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So I am going to choose to pull myself up by my bootstraps. And I'm going to choose his way over the world's way. Uh, I thought uh, Ruth shared this this week in our prayer time. She shared about Jehoshaphat. And uh, this is in Second Chronicles 20.12. Uh, they were powerless. It says this, we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. How many people feel that way? You know, this horde of thinking that is coming against the church. Uh, Josephat goes on, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So it doesn't really matter, everything that's going on, all this bad stuff, because my eyes are on you, God. And no matter what, that's where they're going to stay. They're gonna stay on you because you're on the throne, you're in control, and whatever you would have me to do, I will do it for you, okay? And what happened when the choir began to sing praises to God, when worship went up in the most difficult of times, 
See, because worship is a sacrifice. Worship says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my eyes on the Lord despite the difficulty of the day, despite whatever my last 24 hours was or my last week was or whatever is going on that's just so discouraging in my family or in my world. You know, worship says, I'm going to keep you right where you need to be, Lord. And you're going to stay there. And worship, when they sung those praises to God, the victory was won. The victory was won because God is the victor. And when we keep our eyes on him, the victor mentality, the victor heart, the mama bear spirit, the the spirit of valor and courage that Joshua had, when we keep our eyes on the Lord, that's who God is. He is a mighty warrior. And so when we have our eyes on him, we cannot help. And this is why worship here is so important. We cannot help but get the presence of the Lord and who his character is within us. There is an exchange that happens in that place of worship that is critical, that is vital, that is desperately needed. And if anything, that is reason enough to come to church because we don't get that on our own. Many people don't get that. You should be getting it in your personal time with the Lord, but many people don't. And there's something greater that happens in corporate worship that is different than in personal worship. I can tell you that for a fact. Where two or more are gathered, he is in the midst. But he says one will put a thousand and two will put 10,000. So when we come together, there is more power, there is more presence, there is more of the heart of God, everything of heaven there is more of, because we are together. And this is why God says, do not forsake the assembly of the brethren, because he knows this, because we know there are power in numbers. And so it is critically important as we go forward as the day approaches, that we rally, that we stick together, that we commit to God's purposes in our life and in this world. This is a godly moment. And God knew each of us would be here. This is the, this is the thing. He knew each of us would be here in this time of history. And he's calling forth the best of who we are to come to the forefront. He's calling that forth. He's saying, arise, arise. Let the DNA of God, when we accepted Christ, the DNA of Jesus come to the surface and let that truth come forth. I love you, Brother Richard. So, yes, grab a hold, grab a hold. It is is not so much... I believe, about reclaiming our culture. I believe the culture will be reclaimed once the church is reclaimed. You see, although I want to influence all of these worldly mountains, the truth of the matter is, it is the church that needs to be reformed. It is us and our commitment to Christ that needs to go deeper. It is our commitment to the truth and the gospel that needs to get a hold of us so that we begin to function as the early church did. So I I just want you to hear my heart. It's the church that needs to be reclaimed. And when the church is reclaimed, they don't stand a chance. They don't stand a chance. But it's the church that needs to grab a hold of what God has done. So my heart this morning is to inspire the church to this courageous place of valor with the kind of the mama bear spirit as a visual to not be silenced as a witness in this day and hour. And you might offend a few people, but you don't have to. The truth can be shared. The more love the truth is shared in, the less you will be offensive. And that's really the truth of the matter is that when people know you really care and love them and you share the truth, they don't really get offended because it doesn't affect your relationship. It doesn't, the disagreement is not, it's it's not a part of your identity. 
It's like, I love you regardless if you're going to agree with me or not. I'm just here to share the truth with you, you know? And so there is a way that we can do this that is, that is um, without offense. And Dakota, do you have that other, uh, other video? I, I came across um, a pastor this week who is um, being a voice. But I loved the way he was a voice. And as many of you know, Roe versus Wade is um, hanging in the balance right now. And so this pastor, uh, Pastor Jeff Durbin, uh, he is trying to abolish abortion in the state of Colorado. And I just wanted to play a quick clip for you so that you could see, and this is controversial. Abortion is, is very controversial, and even in the church, it has been very controversial, which is unfortunate. Um, but there are reasons for that. It's not an easy issue. And so, but I wanted to play this clip, not to ruffle anybody's feathers, but to give you a visual of how these um, issues need to be addressed and how they can be addressed and how they should be addressed. All right, Dakota, go ahead. Madam Chair, members, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Bill of Equal Protection for all human beings in your state. I want to thank you all for staying up so late. You guys are out of your minds. Uh, my name is uh, Reverend Jeff Durbin. I'm the pastor of Apology of Church and the head of End Abortion Now. We've raised up about 900 local churches across the country to go to abortion mills to preach the gospel, to offer help and hope and love to mothers and fathers going in, and to even adopt other children uh, if they'll let us. And you've saved thousands upon thousands upon thousands of children from death, and you can prevent that here. Um, and speaking on behalf of over 60 million pre-born human beings murdered since the tyranny of Roe and the thousands killed daily, upwards of 3,000 killed per day in this nation. Um, it's an incontrovertible and irreputable biological and biblical fact that all human beings, uh, all life begins at conception. It's one of the things that's incontrovertible and hasn't been able to be disputed by uh, the members this evening is that the uh, word of God isn't the only standard that says it's the image of God and worthy of our value and love and protection, but science is on our side. You know, it's a fact irrefutable and um, the heads of Planned Parenthood and other organizations admit, yes, yeah, for human conception, we still have the right to kill children in the womb. Uh, that is uh, something that's incontrovertible and needs to be contended with. Uh, it's a moral question, not a biological one. What's in the womb is fully human conception. The only difference is the difference in degree, size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependence. We don't kill other human beings because they're small. My wife would be a huge struggle with that. We don't kill other human beings because of their level of development. I have a toddler who's two years old that I adopted who's going to be killed uh, because he has spina bifida as a diagnosis. His mother had two uh, abortion appointments. His name is Augustine. Um, he, he is two right now. He's not fully developed, and he is fully dependent on us as young shows and parents and other children running around. And we don't kill other human beings because of simply where they're located. So what is in the womb is fully human, and what's being killed in our nation is about 3,000 per day. Um, I, I have so much written here, but I thought, I'm going to change the direction just quickly, uh, refute the arguments against the bill, uh, because they're poor arguments and uh, fallacious, and I want to humbly encourage you to think about them. Uh, this issue is first and foremost an issue of sin. It's an issue of morality. It is also a crime, yes, uh, but it is, it is a sin, and there is hope and forgiveness and peace only in Christ. But sin will not only corrupt us morally, but it corrupts even our reasoning processes. And I want to show you some of that now. One of the things you keep hearing is bodily autonomy arguments. Can we please just ask you humbly, please, I know it's late, to listen to this one thing. Because every time you hear it, it's self refuting All arguments from humans that we have bodily autonomy are pro-life arguments. Because what's in the womb is human. If your argument is humans have bodily autonomy, and the humans in the womb have bodily yeah. autonomy. So every time you hear it, it's self-refuting, every single time. Mr. 
Yes. Your time is up. I, um, if you could just uh, yeah, I'll finish wrap it up. These last slides. Um, the issue of slavery and the Holocaust, they were called beasts and parasites. I'm glad that's behind us now. Uh, but this issue here of the Supreme Court, I'll just say quickly, uh, Supreme Court, uh, the, uh, issue, the, the decision of Roe versus Wade is not law. Congress legislates in our nation. Congress creates law, not the Supreme Court. I meant like one sentence. Yeah, and uh, Judge Scott and your marijuana laws show that uh, states resist the federal government. You do it every day in Colorado. You, re you resist the federal government for marijuana, but you won't do it for children. That's a sin. It's a crime. I call you to turn to Christ and do what's right and establish justice. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, Mr. Medical, you have a question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I have several questions, and, and I think that there's a lot. I mean, that was a lot of testimony. Uh, um, that was just a lot of testimony. Um, so, uh, my first question, and, and I mean, I, I, I probably know the answer, but I still. Uh, want to ask it is is do any of you can you can you relate or or know what it's like to carry a child or carry a child that uh, that may not be able to come to term may not you know we heard uh, testimony earlier tonight about uh, carrying a child that uh, their organs weren't fully developing can you, do, do any of you know what that's like to to, to carry a child or, or or have to deal with that well um, and. Mr. Bourbon? Bourbon, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, we're just to recognize people. Sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sure. Uh, I'm, that's, I'm that, and that's the whole point, because we do have people listening online. I just want to know who's talking. Please stop that and Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I think, I think for the question, sir, the obvious question as to whether I know what it's like to carry a child is, you know, I'm biologically a male and I can't create life. Uh, however, I have five children, and my wife carried them all. And I know when we talk about the emotional impact of a child who is in the womb who has some sort of genetic abnormality, that is a heavily emotional situation because of the value and dignity of human life. We recognize it with both the mother and the child. It's, it, it's, a, it's an impactful thing to consider. For example, my son was in the womb with the worst stage of spina bifida, um, and uh, his mother was, uh, had two appointments taken to kill him. And uh, his name is Augustine, he's two years old, and he's the greatest gift of my entire life. All of life is precious. We live in a fallen world, there is sickness, disease, and decay. These are things that hurt all of us. You feel the way it's hurt, and so do I. But what we don't do is then say, well, these are painful circumstances, so now let's allow people to kill their children. I want to just point out one fact. Less than 2% of all abortions, almost 3,000 a day, less than 2% are because of rape, incest, life of the mother. The other 98% are at will because of convenience. And so when you're talking about a situation like genetic abnormality, like my son was diagnosed with, you're talking about a heavily emotional issue that doesn't allow us to then say, okay, let's kill all the babies at will. Go ahead, sir. Um, speak to that, Madam Chair. Sure. Just briefly. And um, Mr. Uberoff. Uberoff. Yeah. Okay, it's a hard, it's hard name to pronounce. It's easy to forget. <laughs> Fine. Uh, I also speak to that um, when you ask about carrying a child. Um, so again, I'm a biological male. I cannot. That's impossible for me to fully understand. Uh, but I, uh, I have a sister who's Down syndrome. Okay, and so uh, during the stages of development, when they discovered early on that my sister was going to be born with Down syndrome, that would have also uh, fallen into the current laws uh, given now under the category of she would have been developmentally, uh, had developmental issues that would have been allowed for an abortion even early on in the early phases of the, the legislation here in Colorado. Um, it would have been legal for her to, to be killed in the womb. And it was highly encouraged because, uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, to my parents, they said things like, uh, it's going to be difficult for her. She's going to have a hard life. Just, as, just having Down syndrome. But then they also later discovered that she had two holes in her heart. And so as things progressed, they said, well, there's a high possibility that she may not even make it to full term. Um, then they got to the place where they said she might not even make it to uh, delivery, right, through delivery, because it's very stressful on the, on the little one as they get delivered. And again, uh, may I stress here, she was born with two holes in her heart, literally b pumping and bleeding to death as, as she was as she's being delivered. Uh, with that said, she immediately was rushed into open heart surgery, and may I add, my parents decided not to take her life 
and to keep her. She was immediately rushed into open heart surgery, and they said, well, you know, there's a high probability she's going to die at a very early age, which was part of the motivation, motivational factor uh, to abort her. And uh, may I say this today, my sister is 35 years old, has lived a wonderful life, as an advocate for Down syndrome children, and she has spoken multiple times at the state of, uh, uh, in California, uh, at their capital in Sacramento, on behalf of special needs children. So I would say, we need to be very careful in distinguishing, yes, they might be born without organs, but it's really not, in terms of the intrinsic value isn't based on what kind of organs or they don't have, right? The lack thereof, or the quality of life they might experience, or even the quality of life of the parent. We need to do what's in the best interest of the child and do our best to preserve life at all costs. Amen. Um, welcome to the market, and, and we do have other questions from other members. Okay, just thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I think something I'm interested in too was referenced. Uh, you know, and I, I don't know about I don't know where, the, where those statistics were or uh, came from, but uh, I'd be curious to know uh, your thoughts um, on abortion in the case of rape incest or, or the health of the mother. That if, if if you agree with that or if you disagree with that. Question. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Madam Chair, I'll start Thank you, Representative, for the question. I think it's an important one. Uh, the statistic of uh, less than two percent for, for rape and incest by the mother is a, is a commonly known a statistic in, in the industry itself. So it's 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 regularly acknowledged. Um, very important because when we talk about those issues, they are all issues that impact us because we recognize that rape is such a horrendous abomination. It's such a tremendous evil. But even in the Bible, uh, God's law, and that went through the English common law and all through history, it's such a tremendous evil that it was something that was worthy of capital punishment. So according to a biblical worldview and the English common law moving through history, what was handed down to us was that kind of value put on a woman's life, that you cannot do to someone's body whatever you please. Um, somebody cannot, uh, by their own will and force, do something to another person's body against their will. So if you're against rape, you should be pro-life and an abolitionist on our side. Because what's happening in abortion is primarily the issue that makes rape such an abomination. I am doing it to another person's body, something against their will. Uh, but also, I do not believe that in the instance of rape that we should punish the child for the sin of the father. Yes. We should not give children capital punishment because their fathers are criminals. There are so many living, amazing, thriving, beautiful human beings today that are alive and come right here representative and testify to you. Uh, they are products of rape, and uh, they're grateful to God that they weren't killed. Next is, uh, I actually had friends that grew up with that were products of incest. I don't think we should kill them. And when it comes to the issue of the life of the mother, uh, it's such a, it's, for me as a pastor, I'm going to say this, in the last month I've dealt with three miscarriages, one being delivered at the hospital six months uh, in the womb. It's such a dramatic and painful situation for a mother uh, when we talk about an instance where the life of the mother is at risk. However, you guys can check this, later checking on, on this statistic, the number of uh, instances today because of medical technology where the mother's life is truly in danger is so infinitesimally small. But what we do with that representative is we actually go in a situation like that and it is a life-saving operation. The doctors in the hospital are concerned with the preservation of life in both cases, the mother and the pre-born child. When you go to a hospital, they're trying to actually perform a life-saving operation. It's, it's a dramatically emotional situation. And so when we talk about the issue of the life of the mother, I think we're once again back to the question of uh, who says that a human life is valuable? Is it valuable in this instance, but not in this instance? Because that's what exactly what is going on. And the things we all agree with are evils behind us, the issue of slavery and the issue of the Holocaust. Same issue. Representative Ortiz. I would ask you all please stick to answering the specific question being asked. Um, so, the specific question here is, did the Supreme Court legislate, that's option A, or did they interpret the constitu constitutionality of existing state law that was refuted in Roe v. Wade? Well, I don't need like the 10 minute extra, like, I just want the concise, quick answer. Just to Durbin. Yeah, well, uh, our President uh, Joe Biden and the White House Press Secretary uh, do not agree with the idea that uh, Roe versus Wade is law. Um, they, I'm, I'm, I'm specifically addressing your, your question, Representative. 
Um, they said, and, and you can check this yourself a number of times, that they want to codify Roe as law, and I understand that there are representatives in Colorado here that want to codify Roe as law because it's not. Yeah, so it was a review to Texas State Law. Um, Ortiz, uh, do you need to recognize you? Okay, question. Yeah. No, um, but you may not all be the answer, but. You just want to. So, um, and uh, we only have 30 seconds, so if you want to spend 30 seconds and explain that, or if you can. I will, and I, I, am, I am answering the representative's questions, and sorry, he's, he's bothered by it, but it is not law. Uh, Congress creates law in our nation. We can look that up in the Constitution. It's not the Supreme Court. Colorado understands the need to protect their citizens because Colorado defies federal law and the courts every day in Colorado by resisting federal law and court opinions on marijuana. It is against the law federally and by the courts to smoke marijuana in the state. But Colorado says our citizens and their rights are more important, and so we resist the federal courts. And I'm thankful that we have that history, even in the case of Dred Scott. Your um, response, our time is up. Thank you all. Thank you. Your time is up. All right. I wanted to play that full clip because you, you feel the tension of the clip. You feel it when there is opposition to the way that you believe and the way that you feel. And it is tense. And I think the church has not wanted to feel that. They've not 